the Rex and Parks organization has to be a high priority. When we talk about um, development of our children, when we talk about bringing folks back to Baltimore, when we talk about the overall health of our communities, but we can't have serious discussions about that until we really uh, develop how we can drive a more efficient government for the citizens of Baltimore. Uh, you know, through my corporate experience, I've had the ability of managing multi-million dollar large technical projects. Uh, and it's very important that we look at things from a scheduling and performance index perspective to cost performance index perspective. And to be simple, right now in the city of Baltimore, we do not finish any of our large projects on time or at cost. The Baltimore Sun has done an excellent editorial associated with uh, the amount of large unfunded federal mandates uh, and the types of, um, of overruns that we have. You can sit in a board of estimates meeting and you can see cost variances of 20%, 30%, 40%. There's no organization, no corporation that's able to function the way that our city functions today. So in my 15-point plan, we talk about developing a certified project management professionals in a centralized project management organization to manage these large capital projects. We talk about how we can develop ways and metrics to ensure that our vendors are finishing projects on time and at cost. And then we talk about how we can develop ways of truing up our estimates. We have to stop this age-old practice of underbidding to get jobs and just extending the jobs, which has directly impacted the city services and the resources that we have here in the city of Baltimore. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. So when I first moved to Baltimore in 1999, Patterson Park was known as the place to go for drugs, prostitutes, and violent crime. And now it is one of the crown jewels of our city with thriving neighborhoods all around it and several in-demand public schools. Our recreation budget is criminally underfunded. It would be a very high priority of mine to reverse that trend. Currently only 1% of the city's budget is devoted towards the recreation. That is unacceptable. But it's not just about throwing more money at the problem. It's about making sure that the people in charge of our recreation department have clear, measurable expectations and that they're held accountable to do the jobs that we're hiring them to do. That starts at the leadership level. And that's why I'm running for mayor. Because I believe with better leadership from the top down, we will see a much better performance, not just in our rec and parks department, but across all city agencies. And that will result in a better Baltimore for us all. Someone told me a story the other night at a recent forum about witnessing a Parks and Recs employee running over three newly planted trees with their vehicle. And that person still has a job today, not in my administration, and everyone will know that. Thank you. Ms. Walsh on the issue of livability. Uh, I spoke earlier of rebuilding each community. Well, my vision for each community is to have a fresh food economy. So that means that as we pull the concrete out and the bad houses down, we're going to build a grand green space. I want to have a, uh, each community with a grand um, public greenhouse, a uh, barn with some small animal husbandry, filled with trees, with orchard trees, I also envision uh, communities having not just a rec center building, but a, a, an individual kind of recreation. So we should have skateboard parks, roller skating parks, uh, rock climbing parks, uh, motocross uh, park, um, different parks that will cause citizens to want to go from one community to another. I am also somebody that is adamant about not wanting global corporate factories in the city. It will totally devastate our environment. I am one that's going to rebuild a local economy with small business, regional business manufacturing companies uh, owned and operated by people who live right here in the city. That will cut down on all of the, the uh, environmental causes of uh, damages that will be coming if we don't change course. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Mr. McKesson on the issue of the environment. So I'd encourage you to go to the website and see the full plan. What I'll say here is that there are a host of issues we need to talk about. I think about stormwater runoff, that we have to think about what's happening with the sewage and where the water goes and what that means. So much of that work is actually about public information campaigns. Uh, the second part that we can do around that is also honoring the EPA consent decree. The city is under consent decree with the EPA. Um, and we are off track. We're not on track to meet 
uh, the consent decree that we signed, but we can do some things structurally to make sure that we're back on track. When I think about the issue of parks and recreation, I was a teacher, I worked at three public school systems. There's a special assistant here in the Austin Human Capital of Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm keen to the idea of play and what public space means. You know, there's a rapid decreasing of green space in the city and green tops, trees. We can do a tree planting strategy that actually doesn't need to cost the city money, but we can work with partners in a new way. There's so many institutions in the city that are already doing good work, like Parks and People, and we can think about how to scale up programs like that to make sure that the impact is greater. And then the last thing is like a low, low cost, high impact. We could do a citywide intramural league that leverages partners and private private institutions around the city to think about how we encourage play differently that doesn't necessarily need to cost the city so much more, but incurring the cost of coaches, for instance, isn't necessarily a huge cost, and we've seen cities do that in a way that is not, um, not super costly at the city level, but has a wide impact in ways that are demonstrable. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on a little in Baltimore, um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit, but the first thing I want to say is we, we really have to wean ourselves off of burning trash for energy in our city. I think it's terrible that you know, so many of our citizens are, are breathing terrible, terrible air uh, because of you know, these decisions that we made. You know, number two, you know, when we look at rec centers, I think we can do a lot when it comes to investing in rec centers, especially you know, in our poorest communities. Um, rec centers can help provide green space, but also we can do things that are new in the 21st century. Rec centers aren't just going to be basketball courts and swimming pools, but 3D printers and laser cutting, and added manufacturing technology. These are the types of things that are going to be the, 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 the vocations for the next century, and we can be preparing our kids in that way and creating a city that's a better place. You know, there, there are things like gun detection technologies where we can, you know, we can put sensors all throughout the city, and anytime a gun goes off, you know, a, a first responder gets a GPS location and audio recording of that gunshot, and, and somebody goes and sees what's going on. What, what we've seen in other cities like New York, Chicago, D.C., Oakland, is that when these technologies are in place, they see upwards of 49% reduction in gun incidences. In Baltimore, we decided not to do it because we said it costs too much. If we talk about food deserts, there are refrigeration technologies that are used in New York City that help eliminate food deserts by giving bodegas the ability to have produce, you know, fresh produce and fruits and vegetables. Uh, in, in many of our neighborhoods, kids can't get anything except, you know, really you know, sodas and, and, and candies. Let's do things like this that can make our city a better place. And the last piece, bike lanes make our city a safe place as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Embry, on the issue of the environment and livability. Thank you. So Rec and Parks is a department that has been underfunded for decades. And it's really important that we see not the costs of maintaining and creating green space, but the opportunities. Because when we invest in our parks and our tributaries, we improve the quality of life, and we also increase property values. And it's also important to look at um, the fact that this investment in rec centers has contributed to the lack of safety in our city. And in my public safety plan, which experts in the sun have said is the best in the race, I talk specifically about effective interventions for kids so that we're keeping them out of the juvenile justice system. Excuse me. And the fact is, between 3 and 6 p.m. in the afternoon is when children are most likely to be the victims of crime, or commit crimes. And so we have to, as a city, um, invest in after-school and out-of-school opportunities so that they are occupied during those hours and during the evenings and during the summers so that they are not being caught up in the system. And that's having effective rec centers and effective programs that keep kids safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of fairness, to make sure that the folks on this side of the stage have gotten as much time to speak as the folks on that side of the stage, I'd like to suggest that rather than have rebuttals to the questions of livability and environment, that we switch to a final question, which will have to do with education. We'll give everybody a chance to uh, speak on that and then uh, have a rebuttal, and then we'll move to our closing statements so that you'll also have an opportunity to mingle with some of the folks who joined us here at the National Federation for the Blind. So, Mr. Stokes, if that's okay with you. Uh, sure, yes, sir. That's acceptable to everybody. Thank you. Uh, the Baltimore City Public Schools consistently have some of the lowest graduation rates in the state of Maryland, falling nearly 20% behind the state average. What are your plans for the Baltimore City School System, and what role will you play in creating a better Baltimore school system, ensuring that all students receive a quality education? Sure. I mentioned this earlier, obviously, that 89% of all our fourth grade students are below um, proficiency and 88% uh, of our eighth graders are. As the mayor of the city, I will take full responsibility and accountability for the Baltimore City Public Schools. 
this nonsense that mayors say that the, it's not their responsibility, it's not, it belongs to the state, is not the truth. The mayor is responsible for our children and their schools. The schools, when I say, the school system is the most racist institution in this city of Baltimore. It contributes more to the poverty and the missed uh, uh, appropriation of funds and, and, and the health uh, deficiency of our young people than any other institution in the, in the city of Baltimore. I would, first of all, move millions of dollars but accountable to the Baltimore City Public Schools. The city spends 11% of its budget on public schools. The rest of the, every other jurisdiction gives 35 to 65% of its budget to kids, to education. I would move the money so we're jumping in the first four years to a third of the budget goes to education. And I would be holding folk accountable to switching and turning that number around 89% deficits to 89% proficiency within the first two years. Many schools can do it. We have the model. We don't have to reinvent it. I will do it. Thank you. Mr. Cupid, what would you do to improve the city schools? Uh, well, we need to remember that the state did play a major role in our public school system. And I would definitely lobby to get that power back. Um, um, with that being said, I've talked to many different nonprofit uh, organizations that attempt to reach out to our young kids that's problematic. Um, kids that are, that are tardy uh, consistently, kids that, that are absent from school, and try to reach out to them to get them back on the right track. Um, our public schools really is not that difficult to fix. We just need someone to actually care to actually fix it. Uh, we have been better, but over the years we have gotten worse. And that's because of a lack of accountability. And well, let, let's put it straightforward. The leadership has failed us in educating our kids and ensuring that they have the educational uh, skills that they need for the next part of, of their life. Um, that also led to what happened in April 2015, right? Kids not being where they're supposed to be. Kids not being able to uh, get home. So my role is that I will actually be active in the public school system and exercising my power to their benefit. Um, while, I work with, uh, while I work with the state to ensure that our kids are getting the education and the, skill, the skills that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pugh, what, what role would you play in the city schools? Well, first of all, accountability and transparency is important. The book should stop at the mayor's office. I did submit the legislation, testify on today about bringing back accountability to the mayor's office. But let me just say this. Those of you who are aware, and I know that you know this, that learning actually begins in the womb. So the earliest we can start educating our children, the greater their opportunities are for them to move forward and be competitive in the classroom. So I'm doing some collaboration with the medical community so that when a woman becomes pregnant, that we give them the tools that they need that will help them to provide the education that's needed for their children at birth. Secondly, the expansion of Judy Centers throughout the city, which begin educating our children at six weeks of age, I think are important. Universal pre-K is essential if our children, again, are going to be able to compete in the classroom. And I think then making sure that we have similar to the Baltimore Design School, School for the Arts, and some other schools, a board of directors for every school system that does not run the school system, but helps to infuse capital into the, those buildings so that every child has what they need and every teacher has the supplies that they need in order to educate our children and to allow them to be competitive. Thank you, Mr. Pugh. Mr. Wilson, the schools. Again, my name is Wilton Wilson. Um, the schools are terrible. I mean, you go inside the school, we need new schools. We need new classrooms. We need new buildings. We need to have good benefits for teachers to attract the best in this country. If you don't have good benefits, you won't get good teachers. You need to have these schools be safe. If your schools are safe, you will get good teachers. I don't hear anybody talking about that. I mean, the children are under control. So the other thing is that we have to have small size classes. We have 30, 40 children in one class. There's no way you can learn like that. This is not college. I think we should have small class size, 15, 20 to the max. 
And so, therefore, we're supposed to go in that direction. We also, we should make sure that we bring back other uh, subjects into school, like physical education. Why we don't bring back physical education? It's important. When we grew up I and mean, in school, we get that. Why these children can't get that too? So we rob them of the things that benefited us. And now we are in a bind. So we need to make the benefit for teachers attractive, attract the best teachers, make the school safe, and we will on the right track. Thank you, Mr. Warnock. The mayor's role in the Baltimore City Schools. The mayor of Baltimore City needs to take responsibility for the performance of Baltimore City Public Schools. The most important thing I've done in the last 10 years was to create a true community school at Grain Street Academy over at 125 North Hilton Parkway. I invite all of you to come over there. I am so proud of that school. We have 650 kids. We're going to go to 875 kids in the next two years. We have a 120-foot greenhouse, a tilapia farm in the basement of the kids, a basement of the school that the kids manage. Actually, last semester they grew rockfish because they got a better price per pound from Spike at Woodbury Kitchen from rockfish than, than tilapia. They learned science and math with the greenhouse, the tilapia farm, free-range chickens, and our school is powered by solar panels. Through a public-private partnership, we just put $20 million into the building that Elijah Cummings and William Donald Schaefer went to junior high in. And we have the highest percentage of special ed kids of any school in the city. We have a true community school. And while we're teaching our kids science and math and certifications in all those areas, we have to remember that I lost my kids lost four dads since the beginning of the school year to gun-related violence. So we're going to create a community school model where the provision of mental health and traditional health are at the school level. As well as teaching kids science and math, we have to understand that we need to bring our faith-based institutions in and create a true community school model. Thank you, Mr. Warnock. Ms. Dixon of the schools. Thank you. Education is what drove me to become a public servant. And in doing that, I realized that one of the things that has to happen, and that's why I partnered with the University of Maryland School of Social Work, where we created Promise Heights, where we began to work with parents before that baby is born. And as a result, in Zone 17, where it used to have the highest rate of um, illnesses uh, and babies being born unhealthy, now has one of the highest rate for babies being born unhealthy. But not only that, it's expanded into the schools in that district. And through that area, we created community schools, mental health services, not only for the children, but the families. I want to expand upon community schools. The school day needs to be longer. We're in a different day than it was when I used to go home for lunch because my mother was home during the day. We need to expand the day, have a longer school day, have tutorial programs after school. We have to have all the other activities that kids don't get access to during the school day. It's so important. And that's, and as well as accountability, with taking back the schools, because it has to stop at the main. The city has to, we have to continue to grow the budget into public schools versus into public safety, because education is going to be the key to help Baltimore to really grow and expand and develop the many talents that we have and people in the city. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Let's have 30 seconds for Group 1 to respond on the issue of education, Mr. Mosby. The city hall and the mayor's second floor has to aggressively take control of the school system. And I say control not by ownership because that's just semantics, but by accountability. We have to push for, uh, again, lead paint poisoning and abatement and go after the manufacturers of lead point poison. We know that directly impacts our children. We have to provide universal <coughs> four-year-olds through social impact bonds. But we also have to stop the school-to-prison pipeline by developing a school-to-workforce pipeline. Let's provide vocational access opportunities. We know that in Sparrow's Point, they're going to have over 10,000 jobs over the next five to seven years. What are we doing to provide a competitive advantage for our children? Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. I thank the schools. I would give every community the freedom to choose the type of school that they want. As far as I'm concerned, every school should be considered a charter school and have the opportunity to develop whatever curriculum they see is best for their kids. We need to stop telling our parents what's best for them and start listening to them when they tell us what they want. So if they want a STEM school,
if they want a charter school, if they want a tilapia farm, if they want a dual language program, <laughs> let the parents decide. Let's empower our neighborhoods. Thank you. Themselves. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. What the capacity of the mayor is to affect the schools. Well, first of all, uh, I will take the corporate out of, out of the schools. Uh, schools aren't businesses, they're schools. And so I don't see the vocational tracking from K to high school. I'm for broad education. We have the ability to put rigor into schools. We'll make strong vocational high schools with good, well-funded shops and technical. Get them ready for the, uh, for the business world at that point. I'm about fighting for those federal funds that come to our schools. We haven't been getting them. I will make sure they come and are distributed equally. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. McKesson on the schools. So we should reconsider our relationship with the school system. I'm mindful that the school system is a billion dollar organization with 12,000 employees. The city of Baltimore is a 14,000 employee organization with $3 billion budget. So in terms of taking it over, it sounds really simple. But, but it is not, and we need to be mindful of that. In terms of four concrete things, community schools, a commitment to community schools, adult literacy, there is no adult literacy strategy in the city. I talked about home visits before as like an important step, you know, that can get the zero to three. And pre-K, people talk about universal pre-K. The reality is a lot of our kids are here in pre-K. Pre-K, there's like a thousand uh, kid gap right now that we need to close. Thank you, Mr. McKesson. Mr. Young, on the schools. You know, some of the things I think are, are really important when we look at our teachers, you know, we, we hire teachers and principals a week before the school even starts in the city of Baltimore. If we're starting them behind, we're going to start our kids behind. If we're not paying them their first paycheck on time, then we're also, if we're starting our teachers behind, then again, we're starting our students behind. Those things actually happen here. You know, when I speak about universal pre-kindergarten, algebra by seventh grade, calculus by 11th, with the elimination of lead paint poisoning, you know, if you hit those markers, a child literally can be anything that they want to be. That's going to be the number one priority for me as mayor. Thank you, Ms. Embry, on the schools. Thank you. 30 seconds. Um, public schools. Um, I also want to be held responsible for the schools and judged on their performance. And that means a few things. It means, one, being operationally involved at a senior level so that never again does our system miscount students or fail to pay teachers or have ghost teachers. Um, it also means three things that the mayor can have a direct role in attracting or retaining great principals and great teachers, which is really the key to success in our system. It's about building out community schools and building partnerships with resources across the city. And third, it means aligning all of the capital money in the 21st century school building with all of the other resources in the city and neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give each of you no more than a minute to make a closing statement. After this, we'll start on this end of the stage, Ms. Dixon. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here tonight. And I'm running for mayor because I know what it takes to run the city. I know how to manage the city. I know how to lead. I know how to work with people in the communities in order to move the city forward. And I'm willing to step up and do and put every ounce of my energy into the city. Because I, Baltimore is a great city, despite the way that the media portrays Baltimore. But we have to make sure that as we move forward, that we take the politics out of Baltimore City government, the politics out of what happens in our business community, and really collaborate together, and really mean and truly believe that if we have an agenda set, that we can work together, not based on personalities, but based on each of us taking on a responsibility to move Baltimore forward. And so I'm really encouraged, I'm excited. People have uh, pushed me out there to run for mayor, and I'm doing that because of the greatness of the people in this great city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Mr. Warnock. This is the most important election of a generation. It will determine how we view each other, how we view the city, and frankly, how the world views us. Politics as usual and the politicians that are still running for office have brought our city to spiritual and to financial bankruptcy. <coughs> We're running a $75 million deficit and a $744 million projected deficit over the next six years. I'm in this race because city government has been inadequate on almost every level. But I'm also in this race because I rode into Baltimore on that pickup truck 30 years ago, and it's given me everything that I have. And I believe, like we're doing at Green Street, that we can create schools where kids graduate with certifications to get the job of their choice in a global economy. And that we can create jobs for people, like we have at my company and at the Center for Urban Families. We're going to write the greatest turnaround story in America, in Baltimore, together, now. Thank you, Mr. Warnock. Mr. Wilson. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to come to this forum. I'm asking for your vote because I know I can do things differently and we need to take a new path. But I'm asking you, you make your decision. Don't look at it as a person from an ex country coming here as an immigrant. If I'm the most qualified one you think I am, then I'm the choice. It works. The way how things look right now, it boils down to trust and accountability. If you cannot trust someone, if they break your trust, how can you give them a chance again at this critical time? That is very important. So, <clears throat> on your final decision, please follow BultonWilson.com and see what I'm doing and see what I'm about. And I'm asking for your vote one more time. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Ms. Pugh. First, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to be with you all this evening. I'm running to be the next mayor of Baltimore because I'm excited about the future of our city. While we have some problems and we have some issues, as I recall, standing on the corners of North Avenue and Penn, my message never changed. While this city is not monolithic, we 